Hi, my name is Tim Sheldon, and this is my wife, Terry, and this is our story. So a couple of years ago, we were involved in an adult Bible study, and we would bring our granddaughter with us to the adult Bible study, and our granddaughter would get sent off to the other room with the other kids. And as time rolled along, uh, rolled along Pastor Mitch had done a sermon regarding loving where you live, and I was all on board with it because I, everything that he that he talked about that day rung a bell with me. And at the end of the sermon, Pastor Tyler came up and held up this magnet and said, now everyone's got to go out and meet their neighbors. And I kind of was like, oh. And we got home. I was thinking that would be a great thing for Terry to go do. And <laughs> Terry said, time for you to go meet your neighbors. <laughs> so uh, I took the magnet, went out, and met all of our neighbors. And we rolled from that into... Uh, Terry came to me one day and she said, hey, um, I think we need to start a youth Bible study because we go to Bible study every week and Caitlin gets shuffled off into this other room. And I said, that'd be a great idea. I thought that would be awesome. So we began to do some research into it. Terry went to one of our friends, Carla, mm -hmm. and expressed the desire to start a youth Bible study. And Carla was on board with it. And so they began processing what they were going to do because they were going to be the leaders of this. And as it would happen, Carla moved into our neighborhood. So we started with four girls. I put the signs up uh, when they came in a couple days later, put them up, and the very next Bible study, we had about... 23 about 23 the first 23 time. Yeah. kids showed up for that first one mm -hmm. so we immediately went from four five six to 23 yeah and then we actually had peaked out at 42 kids at one point terry and carla have been actually grooming the older kids that are in the that have come through our bible study to become leaders and terry can talk about the kids that are I think, I think the most exciting part of this whole thing is how God is using people in our community, um, people that we would have never expected to come forward and, and volunteer, what can I do to help, you know, is there anything we can buy? Uh, people want to be involved, and that, I think, is the most beautiful thing of the, the, the whole thing, yeah. right, yeah. is um, that we've met neighbors that we wouldn't have normally had an opportunity to, to meet. And uh, so people are coming forward and uh, preparing food. So we're able to feed everybody uh, every Thursday night. Um, we've had organizations come forward, um, like Child Evangelism Fund came forward and did a week's uh, Bible study here in July for our community. We have an activity director here over the park who has a program called the Hug a Neighbor Program. And she's talking to the kids about, hey, you know, if you guys know anybody that, you know, needs help with their yard or they're struggling or whatever, she's, she's trying to make the kids more aware of their community and helping their neighbor. Love where they live. Yes, absolutely love where they live. And uh, we've had a, a woman who was struggling with the loss of, she had actually lost her son and her husband in a very short period of time. And so we were able to... A group of people got together and took balloons and we prayed together and it was just our community coming together to show love and support to another person it was beautiful and I think it's showing uh, or sending a very powerful message to the kids and they're excited about it they want to they're looking for ways to to reach out and, and to love where they live it's a matter of teaching teaching the entire community hey let's let's do this together let's all love one another. Mm -hmm. We also, um, uh, one of the, the adults in our uh, neighborhood want to do uh, like a, a Christmas play where, you know, all the kids that are involved in the Bible study, their parents can come and we'll have like juicy cookies or something. And um, so that's in the works too. So God is doing a lot. God is doing a lot here in Deerwood in our community. And um, we're excited. A, we, we're yep, very excited. We've, we've already got a volunteer to uh, sew all the costumes for the kids. Yes. 
for yes. Christmas time. Um, we uh, have another adult who has found like several little short versions of plays that we can do. So it's just, you know, we're just, this, Tim and I, we are not real super organized people. It's not by our power or anything that we do. We're just willing to participate and God kind of is showing us and leading the way in this because this is all about him. I think that God spoke to Terry and said, you know, this is what you needed to do. And, and Terry came to me and we were like, yeah, now we pray on, you know, we prayed for a long time. How are we going to do this? How are we going to reach out to people? Because just going and meeting people, it, it's way outside of her way comfort zone. Way outside of my comfort zone. And it, it, yeah. it, it's it's a, probably a little bit easier for me, but it's still outside my comfort zone. Yeah. And so we prayed a lot over it and how we were going to do it. And everything has just fallen into place, yeah, you know, yes. as we pray on it, as we pray, you know, show us the way. And then another person pops up and says, can I do this for you? And another person pops up, can I help here? Can I help there? And it's, uh, we kind of, we've stumbled along yeah. doing it. There's times where we go, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's, right? there's people on the left and there's people on the right keeping us up upright. Um, so for people out there who are uh, thinking about doing something in their neighborhood, it is, when you look at the whole big picture, it, it's a very, it seems very big and very scary. Um, but I found that if I'm willing to just step out a little bit, you know, God encourages us and, and he provides uh, people and, and uh, resources uh, for us to um, be able to move forward. And um, God can use you, whoever you are, if you're willing. Yes, man, so glad that you're here. The year was 1989. Disney had just brought out The Little Mermaid. And I was 20 years old. Michelle was 18. We were dating. And I took her to see the movies. This is while I was going to school at Kentucky Christian College uh, up in Grayson, Kentucky, in the Appalachian areas. Took her to see The Little Mermaid. When we got there, there was a family behind us that I knew. I knew who they were. And they had two little girls. And I was thinking to myself that we have no kids here. We're the only ones in the movie theater without any kids. And so we got to talking to this family behind us that we knew. And we said, hey, can we borrow your kids maybe? Maybe we could just have one of your daughters sit with us. And, and we just ended up having a conversation. And, and then it was like this lady said the most amazing compliment to me. She said, I hope when my daughter grows up that she marries a man like you. And I was like, that's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. Who would have thought that just 12 hours later, that same lady would be calling the police to have me arrested? <laughs> Let me pray for you. I'll tell you the story. <laughs> Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for our time of worship. And it is a glorious day. And you have called us out of the grave. You've given us life and life eternal. And Father, we thank you. And I pray today that you would open up our hearts and open up our minds, that we would hear your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what happened was I was staying at a professor's house, and I was house watching for them. And uh, they lived on top of this hill area, and they had very few neighbors. The next neighbor was about a half an acre away down the hill. This was during, in 1989, in the winter of 89, it was a really just fantastically cold winter in Kentucky. And it was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, negative 10 at night. That's no exaggeration. And I was house sitting for this family and they had a dog and the dog was an outside dog. And so what they had done, they had this shed that was connected by a breezeway to their house. And in order to keep the dog warm, they had cut a hole into the shed and let the dog come into the shed. And then they put a cardboard box on the inside of the shed so the dog couldn't come out of the box. And then they hung this 200 watt light bulb down to keep the dog warm. Are you guys tracking this story? All right, so just remember that part of the story. 
I go to bed that night and I sleep and it's about 6 a.m., still dark outside, 10 degrees outside. And I hear this dog just yapping. Yap, 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 yap. This dog's just yapping, yapping. I still got another hour that I can sleep and uh, this dog keeps yapping. So I thought, I want to get up and see what's going on with this dog. And I'm glad I did because when I looked out the bedroom window, I could look and see where the shed was. The shed on the inside of the shed was on fire. And so I slipped my jeans on, important part of the story. I slipped my jeans on, didn't have time for a shirt or shoes. I ran through the house, opened up the door, went across the breezeway outside into the shed, opened up the shed door. Everything was contained with the fire. The structure itself wasn't on fire. So I was able to grab the box and a piece of carpet remnant and the things that were on fire. And I drug them out into the yard, into the snow. And I got this thing under control. So I thought, while it's under control, I'm going to go back inside the house now, get myself on some proper clothing. I'll come back up and finish up the job. And I went to go back in. Do you know those door handles where you can go out the door and it turns, but on the outside it's locked? Those are terrible door handles. (laughs) And that's what they had. 6 a.m., 10 degrees below zero. I have no shirt on, no shoes on. Fortunately, my jeans are on and I, I'm locked out of the house. I have no keys. I have no way to even drive anywhere and nothing, you know. There's like a foot of snow on the ground and 10 degrees below zero. And I remember, I almost, in hindsight being what it is, I should have done this. There was a piece of firewood and I, I should have just knocked out the pane of window, opened up the door, called it a day and, and got the window fixed. But I didn't do that because I remembered the homeowner saying, if you get locked out of the house, the neighbors down the way have a key. So I thought, I think I can make it down there with no problem. But I wanted to take the shortest route possible. So instead of walking down the driveway to the road and down and across, their driveways were long. You know, these are big houses on acre lots apiece. So I thought, I'll walk through the yard, you know, traipsing through the snow now, 6 o'clock in the morning, sun's not even up yet. Do you know that people who live in the hills oftentimes will bulldoze their lawns flat and then build a retaining wall so that they can have a flat lawn? Do you know also that snow will drift downhill over retaining walls and you don't know that they're there? And so I'm walking now, I'm traipsing through the snow, I'm freezing, I'm literally freezing. And uh, I, I hit this drift and just fell about six feet into a drift of snow. Do you know I didn't cuss at all growing up. My family didn't cuss, my mom didn't cuss, my dad didn't, we just didn't cuss. We just didn't think that was a proper way of using language. But for some reason, when I fell in that drift that morning, every word that I never even knew came out of my mouth. I mean, there were words I didn't know that came out. I was like speaking in tongues, cussing, you know, it's like, And I swim out of, if you've ever been in a drift like that, you have to sort of swim out of the drift. I swam, swam out, swam, swam, I don't know. I got out of the drift and I, and I was going up to the, to the, to the house next door. And I saw to my eyes, the lady of the house was in the kitchen and the light was on and she was brewing her coffee and she had her child in her arm. And I thought, I don't want to wake the whole family up, so I'll just step over the bushes and knock on her kitchen window. (laughs) Hindsight, hindsight. When I looked in the window, guess who it was? It was the lady from the night before at the movies who just said she wanted me to, to her daughter to marry a man like me. So I pecked on the window of the house thinking she would go, you know, rescue me. And she looked at me and she screamed, dropped to the floor and crawled under the table, but not before she grabbed the phone. You know, that was, for those of you who don't know, we used to have these phones on the walls. And they had long cords that were attached to them. I know it's a strange world. Uh, and they would have to, you'd have to carry your phone around in the house. And that was the only place you could make a phone call was wherever the cord could reach. She grabbed the phone, crawled under the table. She called the police on me. And I, was, I knew exactly what she was doing when she was dialing the, the phone. And I was even thinking at that point, oh, thank goodness, maybe they'll come and shoot me and put me out of my misery, you know. <laughs> So I figured, you know, she's going to know now. So I went around to the front door, rung the doorbell, and, and I'm like talking through the door. I'm the guy at the movie last night. I'm the guy at the movie. I'm staying at Jim's house next door. I'm locked out. And they finally opened the door, and I just collapsed in their front, in their front vestibule, and they warmed me up with blankets, and, uh, and that's the end of the story. Now, that story was 28 years ago that that story happened. Now, there's been a lot of people that, hey, tell me that story. Tell me that story that happened. There's like a lot of my college friends, 28 years later, hey, tell 
tell me that story that happened. And then they'll start trying to tell the story. I go, no, 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 no. You're not getting it right. You know why? Because that story, I'm the only one. I am the only one that can tell that story. There's nobody else that can tell that story but me. You can try to tell that story. You can try to repeat that story, but you're not going to tell it like me because I'm the only one. That story is unique to my life. Not my favorite thing that happened to me, but that story is unique to me in my life. It's kind of comical for me when Michelle and I are with a group of people and I'll remember a story or something that happened with Michelle and I want to tell people this story that happened to Michelle and inevitably... Every time this happens, I'll start in on a story. This happened, and Michelle's like, no, 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 no. That's not what happened. This is what happened. And so she'll start correcting me, and then I'll keep going with her story, and she'll go, no, that's not right. No, it went like this. Look, let me just tell the story. You guys have anything like that? (laughs) Because every one of us has some stories in our life that are unique to us, and we're the only ones that really can tell this story the right way. I think something is true for every single one of us in this room too. Those of you who have committed your life to Christ, you have a God story happening in your life and it's unique to you and you're the only one. You are absolutely the only one who can tell that story and make a difference in other people's lives. And I think that's critical. And I think as we look through scripture, we see so many examples of people who were, had some sort of a brokenness or some sort of a problem going on, some sort of a physical ailment or emotional ailment or, or, or phys, emotional, spiritual and physical ailment going on. And then they were introduced to or met Jesus and he comes into their life and then all of a sudden their lives are radically changed. And then what we see happening is they immediately go and they begin to share their story. They go share their story. They go share their story with other people. Well, I want to look at an account today in Mark chapter 5 that happened with a a character in the Bible here that's true. So if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'll tell you why. Uh, Mark chapter 5. So pull it up on your iPhone, fire it up on your iPad, or if you have a book, an actual Bible book, it would be Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 20. And I want you to have this and and even make a a note of this too because uh, I'm going to grab a piece from Luke 8 and I'm going to grab a piece from Matthew 8 as well. The way, if if you're new to the the Bible, the way the gospel accounts, so the, the accounts of Jesus, the way it works is there's four different accounts. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each, each one of these are talked about, these, these historical accounts of Jesus and his ministry are looked at from different lens points, from different viewpoints. So just like if you were telling a story or I was telling a story, we might see the thing and tell it two different ways, even though both of us are, are accurate. Well, this is exactly what happened with Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector who Jesus called him. He became a follower of Jesus, and he writes about the experience from Matthew's perspective. Mark didn't get to follow Jesus like that, but he was with Peter. And Peter walked very closely with Jesus. And so Peter tells Mark everything that happened, and Mark writes it down. So that's Mark what we're going to be looking at today. Luke also didn't get to travel with Jesus, but he traveled with Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he also was a historian. He was also a medical doctor. He was very thorough. And so in his writings, when you see Luke, and it's a lot longer than all the others, uh, in his writings, he's much, much more detailed. So he's going and he's asking for eyewitness testimonies of all these people that had run with Jesus and talked with Jesus and the miracles and things that happened. And then John, of course, comes from a different perspective altogether than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John writes from a heart perspective of Jesus and uh, as Jesus, one of his best friends. And so you, so you just kind of get a, a good viewpoint of Jesus' life from both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So today I'm going to talk about Mark in Mark 5, 1 through 20. But if I say something that's not in there, cross-reference it. Go over to Luke chapter 8 or Matthew chapter 8 because all three of those uh, books uh, write about this particular account today. So what happened is, and I'm going to back up to Mark chapter 4 just to give you a little bit of background here. What happened is Jesus had been preaching on the Sea of Galilee. He had been preaching to all these people and he was telling stories. He was a master storyteller, Jesus was. He loved telling stories. He told stories that had a spiritual meaning to it and had a specific purpose to have some heavenly meaning so that people could understand He wanted to capture their attention, talk to them about some relationship with God. And he had been preaching and talking all day long. Uh, to these folks on the edge of Sea of Galilee. After he was done preaching, he got into a boat to get, I think he just wanted to get away, take a break from the people. It was evening time when he gets in the boat. He's been preaching all day long. He gets in the boat and he's sailing off with his disciples. 
And immediately Jesus takes a nap. So we see the human side of Jesus because he's taking a nap here. You know, even Jesus had to sleep. Even Jesus had to eat his peas growing up. And so there was a human side of Jesus. So he was sleeping here after being exhausted from teaching all day long. And then in the Sea of Galilee, in this particular area, uh, is, is, is surrounded by these great hills and mountains and the, wor- the wind will swirl around, even today, the wind will swirl around and a storm can brew up really quickly there. And that's exactly what happened that evening while they're out on the water, it's getting dark and there is a massive storm that takes place. And the disciples are scared. The scripture says they were petrified. They were really afraid. And so they go to Jesus and they wake him up and they say, Master, Master, wake up. This storm is about to sink our boat. We're going to drown. We're going to die. We're scared. And Jesus just wakes up from his nap and in Jesus' fashion just kind of goes, peace be still. And then the whole lake just gets calm. And then it says, and I love this about the scripture, and it says, then they were terrified. You see, they were afraid before because of the nature of what was going on, but now they're terrified. What kind of man is this that can control nature itself? Who is this guy that we're following that can just command the wind and the waves to die down? That's our God. Jesus was with God in the beginning at creation itself. He can command the waves. He can command nature itself. And so they were petrified then. So I want you to picture this scene. So now they've seen this, they've almost drowned. And then they've seen Jesus do something miraculous that no one could do. And now they're sailing into the other side. It says the other side of the Sea of Galilee. I'm picturing that they're coming in at night still. It's still maybe the sun hasn't come up yet. It's 5 a.m. You know, they don't have an interstate going by. There's no traffic. You know how it is when it's quiet. If you've been in the middle of nowhere, kind of quiet, but this is even more quiet than that. There's no planes going overhead. There's no helicopters, nothing. It's just pitch dark and quiet. And they're sailing across the sea. And all of a sudden, up in the hills, they hear this howling taking place. And this howling sounds different than any coyote that they may have heard or any kind of a a wolf that they may have heard. It sounds like a man. It actually sounds like a crazed man who's howling. And they hear this as the boat's getting closer and closer to the shore. And as the boat comes up onto the shore and they step out of the boats, there's already this eeriness feeling of how quiet the lake is, how calm the storm has been. And then all of a sudden, this figure that had been howling that they had heard off in the distance now comes running down out of the tombs and he's got mud and muck all over him and he's got blood from where he had been cutting himself he had been demon possessed this man was up in the mountains and had been demon possessed so much so that he just cut himself to where blood was coming out on him and so he runs down and the disciples, man, they were afraid when, when they were about to sink, when the boat was about to sink, they were terrified when Jesus had calmed the storm. And now they're in this other eerie situation where this demon-possessed man comes down, falls down at the feet of Jesus. And he says, Jesus, son of the most high God, why are you tormenting me this way? Don't torment me, Jesus, son of the most high God. And a lot of times we read this and we think, well, the demon was worshiping God or giving God uh, some sort of a declaration or, or, or he was coming and showing respect to Jesus. And that's not the case. There was actually an ancient superstition among the Jews that if you used someone's full name, it was a way for you to gain authority over them. It was a spiritual authority over their life. And so if you use their full name, you were, gaining, you were trying to gain control of them. So these demons were actually coming before Jesus and going, Jesus, son of the most high God. And they were trying to gain control of the situation because they ultimately knew who Jesus was. They ultimately knew their destiny, destiny in eternity. It's like... Um, it's like if, if you introduce yourself to somebody, they say, hey, what's your name? You don't use your full name. Like my full name is Thomas Mitchell Todd. I don't, there's three first names and three last names, you know. And, and I, don't, I don't say, you know, if somebody says, hey, what's your name? Thomas Mitchell Todd. I don't, that would be weird. It would just kind of be strange. I don't do that. It's on Facebook that way. But uh, that's because there's a lot of other Mitch Todds that are pastors, if you can imagine that. And so um, anyway, but my parents, you know, they would show authority over me in my life when I was in trouble and I knew Thomas Mitchell Todd 
you get over here. Thomas Mitchell Todd, I knew when my parents said Thomas Mitchell Todd, I knew I better straighten up, I better listen, I better do what I'm supposed to do here, you know. And even today, when Michelle says, <laughs> Thomas Mitchell Todd, I know that she's not happy with me and I need to do something different than what I'm doing right now. And that's the way it was right now with, with they, this, these demons were trying to gain control over Jesus. But Jesus cannot be controlled by demons. He has full authority over nature. He has full authority over the spiritual world. Now, I think it's good probably if you're just exploring Christianity and you're here today and this is all brand new for you. Um, or you know, I just think it's probably good to say this may sound a little bit weird, this demon possession thing. Demons might seem weird to you. And I just want you to know a couple things. Number one, uh, demons really are real. You can't believe in God and not believe in Satan. You can't. You can't believe in angels and not believe in demons. You can't believe in the Bible and not believe in demons and angels. They, they, they are a real part. They are a real part of the spiritual world that we have going on around us. The Apostle Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Now, all this stuff that's going on in the world around us right now, we think that this is just the human equation that's happening. All the challenges that we face right now, we think this is just a human equation that's happening. We think it's just the heart of man. There are spiritual forces at work in our world that are trying to detract us, they're trying to draw us away, they're trying to steal our joy, that are literally trying to kill us. Paul says this in Ephesians, he says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood. This is not a flesh and blood enemy thing. The things that you've seen on the news here lately and the things that we buy, this is not a flesh and blood issue. He says, We are fighting against the evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world. There is a spiritual side to this life. And he says, We're fighting against the mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The demons are real. Now, demons are not something that, if you're a Christ follower, demons are not something that you are supposed to be fearful of, not at all. In fact, Jesus has given you full authority, full authority over demons and in their realms, full authority. You don't have to worry a thing at all about demon possession. You cannot be possessed. If you're a Christ follower, you cannot be possessed by demons. Now, if you're a Christ follower, and you're continuing in some sin in your life that can open up the door for demons to oppress you, to be oppressing you in your life. So demon oppression is different from demon possession. And so uh, we want you, we want you, and as Christ followers, we work on this about breaking strongholds in our lives. The things that are keeping us from being all that God wants us to to be and all that God wants us to do. But one thing that's just for important for us to know here that you don't have to worry. If you're a Christ follower, you do not have to worry about demon possession. Now, I do think there's a difference between demon possession and mental illnesses, all right? I do realize that there are mental, there are mental illnesses and there's demon possession. I think though in our culture and in our world, we tend to psychoanalyze everything over here as a mental illness where I think there are also still demon situations in our world. I don't want it to sound crazy or anything. We should do it, like, it'd be fun to do a study on that sometime about angels and demons. I think that'd be fun to do that. But I, I didn't want to say a whole lot about that today. But I did want to just say, hey, this is what this is. And so if you're having questions about, you know, demon possession, this man, this man had a demon possession problem. And he represents all of us, in a sense, who have rocks in our life that keep us from being all that God wants us to be. And so this man it happens to be possessed by many demons because Jesus, he's not intimidated by him using his full name. Jesus says, what's your name? And this demon actually refuses to give his individual name, so he gives a collective name. He says, we are legion, for we are many who inhabit this man. Now, a legion in a Roman army was about 6,000 uh, men. 
I don't know how many demons were there were, but legion represents that there were many demons that had taken up residence in this man's life. And so they say to Jesus, they say, well, will you at least send us out? Because Jesus had already said, come out of this man. They said, would you at least send us into this group of pigs over here instead of sending us to the bottomless pit? Because they knew that their ultimate destiny is hell itself. And so they said, the time is not right yet. Uh, so send us into those pigs. And so Jesus does. Jesus sends these demons into this group of pigs. As soon as the demons go into this group of pigs, 2,000 pigs run down the hill, go jump into the lake, and they actually drown. And it demonstrates to us that demons do what demons do best. They kill, they steal, and they destroy. And I think it's important for us as we uh, realize that about demons. But what happens next is this man who had been crazed, who had been cutting himself, living in the tombs among dead people, he had been shackled. They tried to shackle him. He actually had supernatural strength and was able to break the shackles. So these people hadn't been able to contain him at all. Jesus comes along, casts these demons out of him, and it says he becomes a normal man. He cleaned himself up. He has normal clothes on. And then the townspeople started to come to see him. As the town people came and see this guy, they're seeing this guy that, that they had been trying to contain. They had been trying to kick him out of their area. He had brought fear onto their community. And now they see him who, as a normal person. Now, what do you think their reaction would have been or should have been? What do you think their reaction would be? They would go, yay, this is awesome. This man is finally under control. No, they were actually terrified. They were afraid, just like the disciples were on the lake the day before, the night before. The townspeople were afraid because they saw Jesus' power. Now, what I think about that is I think it's a lot, and it relates a lot to us, like our world today, where it still amazes me about how our culture and politics and school policies and all this want to remove all this stuff from schools. This is not a political thing. I'm not even talking about that today, but I am talking about like, why is it? What are people so afraid of with the gospel message of Jesus? What possibly could they be afraid of? It only brings healing. It only brings hope. It only brings restoration in our lives. And yet people are afraid. I think... And this is, I'm going to give you just my opinion on this. I think what it is, is that if people acknowledge that there is a God and they acknowledge that Jesus is real, then they must have to accept him as their, in their lives. And so, that, so because they would, their lives would change radically, they refuse to accept him. Because there is just something about, I mean, you, you've got to know this. There's just something about Jesus that's different than everybody else. There's something about Jesus' name himself. Nobody ever gets upset. You can talk about Muhammad. Nobody gets up. You can talk about Buddha. Nobody ever hits their thumb with a hammer and says, oh, Muhammad. Nobody ever hits their thumb with a hammer and says, oh, Buddha. But they do that with Jesus Christ's name. There's something about the name of Jesus. There's just something about it. Even if you knew nothing else, you have to know that there's something about Jesus that's different than every other religion, every other worldview. Jesus is completely different. So this man, he returns to normal and the people are afraid and they actually send Jesus away. And so Jesus does what Jesus does when people want him to go away. He goes away. You can send Jesus away from your life. You can. He'll go away. And so that's what Jesus does. He gets in the boat. He's getting ready to leave. But the man who he had impacted his life with by removing the demons comes up to him and says, can I go with you? Can I go with you? And Jesus says, no. I've got something more important for you. I want you to go home to your community. I want you to go to your family. I want you to go to your neighbors. And I want you to tell them what has happened to you. I want you to tell your story. Your story is so important. Will you do that? And that's exactly what this man did. He was in a region called Decapolis, and it was the 10 cities, the 10, the 10 towns around that area. And this man went from town to town to town sharing his story. Man, I was like this. I was this crazed man living among dead people. I was even cutting myself with stones. And then this man showed up, and he freed me from all that. 
And now I'm like this. Let me tell you, Jesus wants you to tell your story. Jesus wants you to tell your story. But I, I want you to notice something. As you look through Scripture in, in almost every situation, before Jesus deals with a spiritual issue in a person's life, he deals with the physical condition first. So if there's a physical or an emotional or a spiritual issue, he'll take care of that. He'll take care of the emotional or physical issue before he deals with the spiritual condition. The woman at the well, the blind man who could see now, he took care of their, and that's exactly what he does in this man's case too. I think that's a good example for us as, as we've seen during this series, stories from the streets from the River Runners. You know, we, we had uh, uh, John and, and Tracy Willie. The, the, we talk about the Matos family engaging in the Perizo community. We had Todd and Tina Marinshaw and the work that they're doing. And we had Bill and Regina Pagan. And then today, Tim and Terry Sheldon. You know what they're doing? Every single one of those stories that have come out of River Run, they're engaging with the community and they're demonstrating and showing love first. They're addressing a physical condition that's going on. Or they're addressing an emotional issue that's going on in people's lives. So then they can share the story of what God has done in their life. And when you begin to, as, as a river runner, as, as a Christ follower, as you begin to engage with your neighbors and pouring out love and loving your neighbors. That's why we talk about this all the time. We want you to love your neighbors. We want you to love your neighbors. When you love your neighbors, the story of what God has done in your life will penetrate their hearts and souls. They will listen to your story. They will listen to what your life was like before you met Jesus and now you met Jesus and this is what your life is like now because you've demonstrated love and you look different, you act different than everybody else in the world. So Jesus has called you to tell your story. Now real quick, I'm just going to do this real quick. There's six things about your story. Six things about your story. If you've got room... Uh, somewhere on your program, write this down. Don't take up the space for the notes because I've got something else I want you to do for that. If you've got a little, find, find another, write on your neighbor's back or something, write these six things down. First thing about your story, your story is unique. Only you can tell your story. And we talked about that at the beginning. You're the only one that can tell your story and it's your story. The second thing is, only you can tell your story. Your story is unique. Only you can tell your story. The third thing is your story is part of God's story. Your story is part of God's story. And your life before Jesus, your life before Jesus and how you met Jesus and what your life is like now, other people will find their story inside of your story. Not everybody will. Not everybody's going to relate to your story. But other people will find a little bit of their story inside of your story. And that's so critically important for us. Because you may think that you've messed up in your life. You may think that you're worthless and useless. But God wants to use your mess for his message. God wants you to use the misery that you went through for your ministry for others. He wants you to use that. That's usable information. Those are tools that God wants to use. Your life story is so critical. Your mess becomes your message. Your misery becomes your ministry. I got a fantastic email from a river runner this week that uh, I wish I could share their name with you, and I wish I could share with you even more backstory because it would make this so much more powerful than it already is. Uh, but I want to share with you this email that came from a river runner. She said, I've made some pretty bad decisions in my life and never thought that God could use me ever again to witness, let alone lead others to Christ. But God is full of mercy and restoration. He has used my brokenness and my willingness to be real with my coworkers and opportunities to talk about him, to talk about his love, to talk about his grace. The pain that I went through was not in vain because I have a deeper empathy for others who are in pain. 
which allows me to truly love them like Christ would. It has opened up so many conversations, and through those conversations, I have had the privilege of inviting one of my co-workers last year to church. I baptized her, and we have been working through the Growing in Christ study together. I praise God for the opportunity to mentor her. She is my daughter in Christ. I then invited another co-worker to church who has come several times and has expressed an interest in getting baptized after hearing Pastor Tyler and Justin's message. Praise God. I've come to realize that I don't have to be perfect for God to use me as an instrument to reach others for Christ. I simply say, Jesus, shine through me so that others see only you and not me. Holy Spirit, help me to see and hear those that are hurting so I can show your love and compassion. I'm grateful that God can use someone like me to love my neighbors at work. That's powerful. God can use you and God will use you. If you are faithful to him, he will use your story and other people will find their story inside of your story. The fifth thing is you can tell your story right away. You can tell what Jesus did. You can make a difference in the kingdom of God right away. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have a PhD degree in the Bible. You don't have to know all the theological terms that you need to know. Hey, you don't have to know all that stuff. Not saying it's not important. Not saying you shouldn't study God. Not saying you, you shouldn't dive into his word and have a, a richness in it. Not saying all those things. Just saying you don't have to wait before you begin to make a difference. You don't have to know everything. This guy, this guy, when he's going to the Decapolis, the, the ten regions, and he's going he, there was no point where he was telling the story about what his life was like before, how he met Jesus and what his life's like now. There was no point where any of those people go, yeah, but what is your, uh, what is your eschatological view of the Christology of dispensationalism on the millennial? What? Dude, I don't know. I just know before I was living up here with dead people. I was cutting myself. I couldn't even think straight. I met Jesus and now I'm freed. Think about the other people. I don't know. I just know I was blind. The guy put some spit and mud in my eye. Now I can see, you know. I don't know. My life was just like this. And now it's not. And then I met Jesus. And now I'm who I am now. People aren't going to question your theological stance. You will be able to make a difference in people's lives by telling your unique story. I've been in Rooted before where men will tell their stories and, and, and it's been fantastic because there, there'll be like these, men, this has happened more than once where there'll be like men's men. I'm talking about like, real, like a man's man like me, you know, real, <laughs> real man's man. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so there'll be like real man's man st stand up and go, yeah, this is my life. My life was like this before. And, uh, and I came to Rooted and uh, I met Jesus and uh, you know, and then just everything just started happening. I don't know when to go around. And then it was just, and then this happened. And then all of a sudden, I just feel like I'm whole again. I go, I have no clue what that guy just said, but God really touched his life. What an amazing testimony, you know. I've seen that happen. One of my favorite testimonies of all times. I mean, this is like my favorite all-time testimony. This was 18 years ago. I was visiting a church in Albany, New York, and we were learning about some different techniques of church and ministry and stuff. And I went to this church, and I was just watching this church service. And this guy from Schenectady, New York, this is a steel mill town in Schenectady area. This guy shows up. He's about 50 years old. He's got his work boots on. He's got his Dickies work shirt on. He's got this white T-shirt on. He hadn't been to work yet, so he probably was on his way to work after church, or maybe that's the only clothes he owned. Only thing he didn't have on was a hard hat. And this guy, you would just kind of picture this hardened guy. And he stands up before a church about this size. And he stands up there, and he's nervous wrecked. He goes, uh... A few months ago, well, I didn't know who in the hell God was. <laughs> and he goes, now look at me. <laughs> and the whole church, I mean, the whole church erupted with applause. I mean, they stood with like a standing ovation and they just erupted with applause because they got it. This is a powerful testimony of what God can do. There wasn't a single person that was, not, that was worried the fact that he said the H word in church, you know. Not one person. By the way, that word's also found in the Bible. <laughs> Probably not in that context, but, you know. I mean, it was awesome, 
You don't have to have this PhD degree to be able to share your story, to impact people's life. But it's what we're commanded to do. It's what we're commanded to do. Now, when I was growing up and, and when, I was, when I was first starting a ministry, we had to do these models. Uh, and it was like the Kennedy explosion. Anybody do that? Anybody do the Kennedy explosion evangelism techniques? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? So I'll, just real quick, it, it was like this flow chart. You had to follow this flow chart. If you had a conversation with somebody, you had to follow this flow chart of the conversation. And so you'd go and you'd knock on the door. I mean, it's like a cold, cold, cold. Cold, cold call calling. And so you'd go and knock on the door and they'd come to the door and you'd say, excuse me, do you mind if I ask you a question? And they would say, um, no, I guess it's okay. And so if you were to die tonight, are you certain of where you would spend eternity? And if they said no, you know, you pulled your paper out and you went, okay, no, 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 no. Okay, would you be interested in, you know, it was like this so impersonal. It was so impersonal. There was no relation. In fact, I'm not saying, hey, if you've done that, if, if people, I know there's people that have been one to Christ because of that. If you were one, you know, that's fine. I'm not saying anything bad about it. At least you're doing something, you know. That, but that's just not for me. That petrified me. That petrified me. But for me, I want to show love to my neighbor. I want to develop a relationship. And then I want to tell a man, before I met Jesus, this is what my life was like. I was broken. I was insecure. I had deep anxiety issues. This is how I met Jesus. A guy told me a story about Jesus. It was my grandfather and then my dad and then my mom. They continually told me stories about their lives and stories about how God impacted them and what their life was like before they met Jesus. And I met Jesus and now my life's far from perfect. I mean, I got a long way to go, but I would tell you there is a peace that passes all understanding. I can't explain it. I can't explain everything to you on it. All I know is I met Jesus and after I met Jesus, my life has radically changed and is continuing to transform and change. So that's telling your story, telling your story, telling your story. Sixth thing, real quick. And this is important. When you tell your story to others, Jesus tells your story to God. You may not have thought about it this way, but I want you to think about it this way. When you tell your story to others, Jesus tells your story to God. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, everyone who acknowledges me. So Jesus is saying, everyone who acknowledges me. You could say, everyone who tells their story about what I've done in their life, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I'm going to tell your story. I'm going to acknowledge you. I'm going to acknowledge before my Father in heaven. I'm going to acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. So when you engage in people's lives to help them have this same peace that we have in Jesus Christ, when you're telling your story, Jesus is going to tell your story to God. What if, what if every one of us in this room left here and went and told our stories to our neighbors, to our workers, co-workers, to our, to our friends at school? What would happen if we began to share the richness of what God has done in your life? I believe it would bring hope to our community. I believe it would radically change our community. I believe we would be Christ followers in action. So I want to encourage you to do that. Now, I put down in your, in your bulletin this week, I just put down three questions. Is this real simple? You don't have to make this so difficult. What was your life like before you met Jesus? How would you meet Jesus? Chances are there was somebody that told you a story about their life. And then what's your life like now? Will you do that over lunch today? Will you sit down and talk through that, write that down? Be able to have that in your mind. Just so simple that you can share your story with someone in two minutes. And if they want to know more, you can share more. What was your life like before you met Jesus? What's your life like? How'd you meet Jesus? And what's your life like now? Would you stand with me? And I want to pray with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week's Labor Day weekend. We have a really, really awesome service plan next week. As we're, we're going to do this worship piece here, I just thought of something. I just thought of something. While this worship song is, is playing, this is a, it's kind of a, a new song. It's, it's soft. Uh, while this worship service is playing, will you start thinking that in your head? What was my life like before Jesus? How did I meet Jesus? And what's my life like now? If you've not met Jesus yet, and your life is still over here, 
and you need to meet Jesus, I would love to talk with you. I would love to talk with you. I'll be down over here on the cross if you'd like to talk. Not on the cross. I'll be standing. <laughs> I'll be standing by the cross. <laughs> All right. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way that you love us. I thank you for the stories in our lives, the stories in this room. I thank you for the stories during this series that we've heard from the Marinchas and the Pagan family and the Matos and the Willies and the Sheldons and so many more river runners who engage. And I pray that we'll encourage each other and motivate each other and think of ways to love you more and love our neighbors more. And I pray that we won't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that we will share our story and what you've done to help others find their story in ours. We pray this today in Jesus' name.